Hello, everyone. I'm Prerna Bhanushali, Regional Customer Success Manager for India and EMEA at Jove. Thank you so much for joining us today in this session of Jove webinar series, Engaging Students with Video, Remotely and On Campus. The digital era began decades ago, but its sheer power and utility was demonstrated during the pandemic, and we have come to learn so much from it. Our session today will focus on how to make the most of educational videos, hybrid teaching and learning practices in a post-pandemic world. We will take a look at how today's panelists maximized the use of video in education to amplify learning in a hybrid model and pioneering educational technology. Before we begin, let's get a few housekeeping items out of the way. I would like to bring your attention to the toolbox options on your Zoom screens. Can everyone please use the raise hand icon on the toolbox to let me know you can hear me. Well, brilliant, thank you. If you would like to ask our speakers any questions, please submit them in a Q&A section of your toolbox. We will answer as many questions as we have time for during the Q&A at the end of the session. You will receive a recording of this webinar via email in the next 24 hours. And lastly, at the conclusion of this uh, session, there will be a brief five question survey. We would appreciate you providing your feedback so we can continue to improve our webinars. Without further ado, I extend a very warm welcome to our today's speakers, Dr. Ella Messami and Dr. Safra Sor. Dr. Ella Messami is a lecturer in neuroscience and a Kite Fellow in Curriculum Design and Internationalization at Keele University in England. Dr. Safra Sor is a professor of biochemistry and the chairman of the curriculum committee at the Tel Aviv University in, England, in Israel. Their work, as you'll soon find out, highlights the potential of videos in hybrid learning from classroom to practice. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Masemi and Dr. Saur. Shall we begin? Thank you very much. Um prayer now for the nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Let me go to the presentation mode. So is everything okay? Panelists? Awesome. So yes. let us talk about, thank you, ta uh, hybrid teaching and how we can make the most of educational videos. Well, when it comes to technology-led curriculum design and usage of educational videos. What we have in mind uh, to begin with is to maximize the engagement of students in the classrooms, uh, whether this is remote or on campus. We also uh, would uh, be interested to enhance the, uh, their active learning, their retrieval, their memory formations, and therefore um, maximize their potential to actually find a job at the end of their education period within uh, the, the higher education centers. So they are preparing them for that global competence. And to be preparing them uh, for that global competence, it's not just the knowledge we need to transfer. We need to help them gain transferable skills. And using educational videos perhaps would be an enabler tool to allow us achieve that. But is there any boundaries? Is there any limitation? Is there anything that we need to consider as we are uh, developing a technology-led curriculum, as we are using these educational videos and uh, embedding them uh, within our lectures, within our um, uh, you know, information system platforms? 
well, for sure, it, this is fun because in my classrooms, as well, as soon as I say, there is a video I'm going to show you now, or there is an interactive activity, um, everybody leaves their cell phone and Instagrams and Facebook and just pay attention to the class. So one thing is for sure that we can engage them better when we are using educational videos. So this is an enabler for me, not only transfer knowledge, so we are going to this education card to, um, this is a passive learning for all of us students. But when we actually design these videos, uh, whether this is my lecture that I am, um, you know, uh, uh, from behind the camera talking to the students and transferring knowledge, or this is something uh, to uh, engage and embed the videos, for instance, research videos from the job or from other providers to actually give them a glimpse of what, what is happening in the research field. It, this is all helping the students to gain knowledge, to enhance their digital literacy and of course, we are overcoming some, some of the barriers. And uh, this is just not having access to all the tools and facilities within various research centers. It's much more expensive if I want to arrange 150 neuroscience students to go and see a functional pharmacological MRI in a center. It's not feasible to fit them all in. But with embedding one of the, let's say, Joe videos or other providers, I can simply bring the lab into the classroom and share that experience with them. So not only this is the passive learning with education, this is transferring knowledge and content, but also linking what I'm teaching them in terms of theory with practice in the research field. Has it anything to do with innovation and discovery? Well, basically, as we do um, incorporate this in, um, educational videos within the curriculum, we are already innovating. This is something new in, in our teaching system. We are prior to pandemic, I would embed a couple of videos within the presentations and PowerPoint in the lecture theater. Now I'm incorporating them in the video, in the educational video that I am preparing them. So already this is innovative. About discovery, if we have sufficient time and not to commute from one center to the other. If we have sufficient means, so we are saving uh, uh, enormous of these funds that need to be arranged to attend the conference, attend the seminar, there will be enough means, enough time to actually think outside the box, do some innovation, some discoveries in the research. So spend our time in a very efficient manner. But would every student benefit from it? The barriers that I was talking about, and I'm going to refer to it throughout my talk, one of them is digital literacy. Not all of our students are um, IT savvy to be able to work with these technologies. And uh, not all of my students could be able to afford it, afford even purchasing a PC or laptop, or uh, afford having a Wi-Fi. These are personal experiences. I have students and I am working in a developed country, but there are a handful of students that might have these limitations. How we can overcome it? Again, it, this requires infrastructures, this requires organizational leads in um, uh, working closely with educators to identify students who need it, perhaps providing separate laptops, separate um, uh, devices, enhancing their digital literacy, how to use these devices, how to engage better and enhance their knowledge. So these are a couple of uh, limitations we are facing. And we are going to refer to other limitations and things to be aware of to create a, an inclusive curriculum that all of our learners could be benefiting from as well. And uh, during the talk, I will also address how we can make this accessible for developing countries and those who actually need it perhaps the most and cannot afford it. So the idea is creating an inclusive technology-led curriculum preparing our students for that global competence, helping them succeed in their career, and overcoming those barriers, helping the students to, who might um, stay behind to bring them actually back to this field to make them competitive for the uh, job market. And of course, we can use these educational videos, not just 
for the teaching purpose, for the transfer of knowledge, but also creating an environment to help them identify career options. The example I provided for you for incorporating research videos are a perfect example to demonstrate what is the day-to-day -day life of a research scientist in the preclinical research or in clinical fields. How do a doctor operate? The students do not need to shadow a doctor nowadays. A preparing educational videos just to talk with a professional to tell them what is a one day life in, in the life of a medic, in the life of an engineer or an astronaut, uh, as astronomer or astrophysics scientist or um, electrophysics uh, scientist, then uh, that would bring them closer to that career um, choosing and selecting appropriately based on their needs. So examples, already I mentioned through the talk, that could be a video lecture that uh, the Professor Safrir is going to nicely illustrate it after me. And you're gonna um, see uh, close and personal how he develops uh, his lecture, um, his lectures, makes it interactive and so on. Uh, I will also provide some examples from my own work, but the, the perfect combination is that not just focusing on today and now, but thinking about the future of our students, thinking about connecting our curriculum with the workplaces, thinking about connecting our curriculum with the research and research places without spending too much money, without spending too much time and make it greener because if you don't commute, therefore there will be less pollution as well. And I, of course, I will provide some examples about how to incorporate educational videos in the laboratory before laboratory to pre prepare our students um, what to expect, how to get ready, what are the steps in the research that they are going to get engaged with. During the laboratory, video recording will be shown to, show, will be shown to them to, to you know, uh, update their memory. Again, you're talking about retrieval and memory formation and enhancing that learning um, and acquisition. So, and afterwards, those educational videos that are more appropriate towards data analysis would be something to share with the students after the laboratory practical, again, to enhance their learning, different skills, adding more transferable skills to them. And of course, um, uh, th this would give them an opportunity to enhance other transferable skills such as digital literacy as well. In one of my modules, I created a flipped classroom. So in a way for the intermodule assessment, the students need to prepare an educational video out of a research paper or simply provide um, flipped classroom lectures. They have to work in a group. So this educational video that they are providing would again enhance their transferable skills, how to handle PowerPoint, how to record things. Um, is, is it matter that they voice should be clear what are other skills such as teamwork and working with peers that they can develop through this experience of preparing educational video now. Uh, so in order to do so, again, the educational video that I can provide them is how-to videos, how to do this, how to um, enhance your digital literacy as you are preparing for your uh, intermodule assessment, as you are preparing as a learner preparing an educational videos. And of course, we can make these videos much more interactive by adding quizzes, um, uh, polls, and interactive activities, such as a pair matching of uh, two parts of the uh, scientific contents, and QA sessions, multiple choices. I personally use um, Nearpod in my lectures, uh, video lectures, or in the classroom. And um, Professor Safrir is going to show you how he develops and interactive sessions and in interactive QA sessions in his presentation after me. So these talks are gonna be very well connected. What I will leave you towards the end of this session is that to think about how we can use technology-led curriculum design to make our assessment technology-led. I believe that Joe has started creating a pool of QAs uh, uh, question and answers that can be used by higher education centers in the UK, um, but can we make it more authentic that um, on you know, universities across the UK 
even globally can benefit from this pool can we move away from that old style essay writing and correcting over 8,000 words of the students that make students blind and, and educators blind at the end of the uh, exam period of time. And the students would only focus on one thing. We never test the breadth and depth of their knowledge enough. Could we work hand in hand with these providers such as Job and other companies, small uh, to medium sized enterprises to develop something that both educators needs and learners needs and it would help preparing our students for that success, for that global competence. Well, I already mentioned few limitations. I already mentioned how we should think about um, uh, considering all of our learners when as we design inclusivity, thinking about the students who might not be able to afford it or not have enough uh, digital literacy and how we can overcome it by even preparing how to educational videos. But there are other limitations. There are other things we should need to consider. Students with hidden disabilities, whether this is a visual impairments, whether this is a spectrum of autism. So when I'm designing my slide, do I incorporate enough splash of color that makes it interesting for students who are suffering from a spectrum of autism? Or do I have a, a, a size of font and format of the font enough contrast in my presentations, in my videos that I'm preparing that makes it interesting, engaging, not too, too small, not too large? Um, so these are all points that have been discussed in pedagogy lectures, in pedagogy papers, research papers, and these are evidence-based and of course we can read and implement learn from our peers whether through webinar whether through reading papers and then implement within our organizations and within our classroom to make our technology-led curriculum more inclusive well Despite all the things I said, there are always things that we might forget, we might not pay attention to. First thing is that not one size fits all, not a technology led teaching and learning is for everyone. People have different needs. This educational uh, video might not be suitable for person A, might be more suitable for person B. They might have different needs as learners. They might have different goals and aims and objectives as learners. How we can actually pull everything together as we are preparing our lectures during one semester to give enough diversity to our talks, to our presentations, to our technology-led uh, teaching, to actually support all of our learners achieve their goals. One way is student voice, and that's something that we have at Kiev. The key is we shouldn't wait till the end of semester. I gave a few talks uh, now, like two or three in the past two, three years, that uh, emphasizes that earlier feedback of students is the key. So if we leave it towards the end of semester, their feedback is valuable, but we cannot make sufficient changes for the same cohort. The next cohort might have different needs, might have different aims and objectives. So it might be too late. So think about ways that we can actually incorporate student voices, student thoughts um, to actually modify our curriculum as we make progress to benefit the same cohort as well as others. And of course, as a team of educators and leaders within the higher education centers, we need to sit back and during perhaps summertime and reflect on our curriculum, reflect, reflect on the use of education technology in our curriculum and see what we can fine tune. Is there anything we can, we can take it from here and use it further or there's something we need to tweak or completely move away from. Example would be traditional assessment and make it more um, you know, modernized and technology led. Okay, with this brief, I'm gonna show you a few examples, three or four examples of the work that I've been doing and using educational technology in um, my um, 
uh, organization. Of course, I've used educational technologies in previous organization, the University of Manchester, and even as a postdoc to educate myself as a medical student back in the developed country. I used to sit uh, or book the room, which was called uh, audiovisual center for one or two hour a week, could, you could get a slot and sit there and watch educational videos about central dogma, about how we actually diagnose a Parkinson patients. You don't let a first year uh, medical students go to clinic and visit a Parkinson patients. But those educational videos all were in English, despite the fact that I was from a country that um, English was not the first language. But I would watch these because uh, I wanted to educate myself further. I wanted to learn more. But can we actually um, bring this passion uh, out of our current learners and expose them to this pool of information and technology, this pool of information systems to actually benefit from, to educate themselves, gain transferable skills and prepare themselves for global competence. Something to think about, reflect, and hopefully discuss during the QA session. This, what you see is the module that I'm managing. It's a neuropharmacology at Kiel. And as you see far before the COVID started, we created this platform to engage with the students. This was early in March. We started with, uh, I created small short videos about how to write an essay. What is the importance of peer peer reviewing? How, what, uh, what we should consider when we provide a critical appraisals. And then gradually, as you see towards the end of the semester, um, I started integrating an embedding some of the educational videos from Joe. These are research videos. It would have been far difficult to arrange anything for my student cohort who are um, educating themselves on uh, how drug discovery happens in neuroscience uh, discipline to take them into MRI center, maybe booking the whole room, that's not feasible. In preclinical um, uh, pre -clinical study laboratory, that's not feasible. But it was feasible to take them and, uh, and to embed one of the videos that we had subscription and show them how the research is done within this discipline. What is the day-to-day -day activity? What is this procedure and, and step by step using the illustration that is embedded in, in, uh, in, in the video of Joe to learn how actually the experiments carried out and what is the actual day-to-day -day activity of the uh, observer when it comes to the uh, performing experiment, doing discovery or um, doing intervention studies in the laboratory. There is no need to take the students who might not tolerate blood in, into the preclinical lab and literally model a stroke in front of them. They're gonna faint. Faint. One of the things that I saw, so this is the blog I created, but during the lectures or QA sessions, I would embed some of the videos from Joe, from Nearpods into the presentations on the live, uh, in the live lecture theaters as well. I clearly remember that one of the students approached me and she said that, oh, that wasn't necessary because I can't tolerate, you know, uh, models of disease with animal. And I thought that was really unnecessary. So I reassured her that was the aim because I have a cohort of 150. The other 120, 130 were really passionate about this type of research. That gave them a clue that this is a direction for me that I can go forward. I can search for the lab that is doing this drug discovery and uh, using models of disease. And for those students who might find it really not interesting, that actually is also the aim because they don't need to wait their time. They already had a glimpse of it and they can move away from this type of research, find their passion in the area that they are interested in. Another module that I'm a lecturer, I'm not leading it, is the laboratory skills. In this laboratory skills uh, practical sessions, uh, neuroscience students are getting um, few weeks in their own experience in the laboratory. My session was histology. What I came up with, of course, I have a team to work with and uh, work closely with uh, 
but what I designed for this laboratory practical is educational videos. As you see here, the part one video is just telling the students, this was communicated via email, that how to actually access the Blackboard and find their way around this pool of information. Um, for the sake of organization and putting everything together, you see that everything is also included in the Blackboard as well. So next year we can refer to it, fine tune it and reuse it. The second part of video is actually walking uh, step by step with students to tell them what is expected from them there during the practical, what are the stages that they are doing during the histology and how to prepare themselves for in advance, health and safety issues, and so on and so forth. So when the students are in the laboratory, and I had over 60 students during the peak of COVID November last year, we could manage them. Yes, they are sitting in distance, but they already have sufficient information to begin with. And of course, these videos were playing in loop if someone didn't have access to videos prior to the session. So again, I thought about inclusivity. And I made everything available in here in case they can, the student didn't have time they had to work and study so they didn't manage to actually catch up in advance. The third part of the uh, video is actually a, a video designed for analysis of data. Do we really uh, need to keep the students in the lab next to xylene and other toxic materials when they want to just analyze their data? For sure, no. So we can come up with this idea of designing a video that is going to actually guide them step by step how to download image, how to install it, and how to go through the um, data that is provided to them in case that experiment didn't work. They had these control slide images and the ablated one, the pathology one, to use it in the uh, image for analysis how to open a file step by step. I, I just created a snapshot of it for the sake of this webinar. So we are not spending too much on unnecessarily on one video. And as you see here, they are gonna get information, how to count cells, how to extract data, and how to compare a control tissue with healthy cells and nuclei and control it with a uh, pathology, uh, the pathologic one, and then count the cells, extract the data, and save them um, appropriately and then compa uh, compare and contrast their data using a sophisticated a statistical analysis. Could be a prism, could be a SPSS, could be a simple Excel, we don't mind. But the reality is we are using educational videos to actually minimize their presence in the lab if it's not necessary. That was for the health reason, but for the COVID reason. But if you are real, in reality, students might spend five, six hours in the lab. Do we, do we really need, the, need to keep them in the lab so long? Or should we let them to have a proper pause, proper break, and a start over? Another example would be uh, providing lecture videos, educational videos that are um, meant for the passive knowledge transfer. This is a module, again, I manage a special census. And as you, pardon me, as you see, uh, in here, um, we have a list of lectures that my peers and, my, and myself would be delivered. Let's focus on the um, visual disorder. And as a student click on it, it would take them to a list of um, videos, of course, with the PowerPoint for the content transfer. And what we did like uh, it was inter innovative again, instead of one long hours that a student might be dif have difficulty facing difficulties to download the video or stream it, live stream it, we broke it down to 20 minutes. Of course, it doesn't really matter if it is 15 minutes or 25, because you can't stop a topic right in the middle, but we can create in a small chunks. This way, a student would be able to watch on the go or download it quicker have sufficient pause, think about their mental health and physical health in between the um, sections when we paused it, and therefore um, they would learn as they make progress. What was incorporated in the videos, as you uh, will see in here, is not just the knowledge transfer, but of course, incorporating videos in edu educational videos. This could have been a job uh, videos, 
bringing research closer, or could be a near pod animation, or could be simply um, a short video, a glimpse of how the uh, examination of patients would be uh, performed and what they should take away from it, in addition to the theory that we are talking about. And Professor Safir is going to tell you much, in much more fascinating way how these videos are created in a very affordable way and in a very interactive way to incorporate some questions, QA answers uh, within the video to make it more engaging for students. And uh, within, uh, of course, uh, and you're gonna hear it from him as well. Put everything in a nutshell and think about our future directions. We talked about the uh, ke keeping inclusivity in our mind as we design a technology-led connected curriculum. Our lectures shouldn't be a video, educational video from my topic to uh, you know, the next person is in biochemistry or um, histology and so on. We need to think about this spiral format of the curriculum design, the, the connectivity between topics as well. What I am providing students about neuroanatomy should be complemented with neuropathology in their next year and uh, think about the uh, how we can enhance the interactive activities as we develop these educational videos. But of course, as I mentioned before, we need to reflect on our approaches, incorporate a student's voice and a student feedback sooner rather than later. And our golden aim is to enhance the employability of our students, our learners, and prepare them for that global competence for that job of the future. In nutshell, Having educational videos are brilliant because a student can access them on demand. We address limitations of it. We are going to talk about some of the disadvantages of it as well, and hopefully we discuss it during the QA session as well. It has a green impact. We already address a few of them. We don't need to commute, so greener, less air pollution, greener environment, less time is consumed. We can spend time with family. You can pause and watch, rewatch and rewind it as much as you want. It's a flexible approach. It's an agile approach. We are not saying we remove all the laboratories and all classroom, but we take a blended, a hybrid approach from now on and make the most of educational technologies, things that I have been like begging every peers or colleagues and the students to do and, and use it for many years now. And now we are forced to do it and hopefully we can learn something positive from it and bring it forward. We can use these educational technologies to mimic the research and research centers and, and, and uh, pardon me, give a glimpse of what is happening in laboratories, clinic, engineering field without uh, taking learners into those environments or worse, students start a journey in medicine, nursing, engineering, teaching, and then they realize after, you know, towards the end of their education that this is not for me. I am not enjoying it. I'm not loving it. And of course, we know that it's a, a happy society, it's a healthy society. Thinking about global competence and thinking about the one size does not fit all always and always think about the learners and their needs. Can we take it further and think about the uh, other implications of educational videos, such as using educational videos and, and technology led um, uh, platforms for assessments and feedback, enhancing feedback literacy of students? Another example I didn't mention is I provide feedback through educational videos after reading my students' final year project, research projects or dissertation. It might be hard to find time for one-to-one -one discussion in an office if my student is working. And therefore what I do, I go paragraph by paragraph, pause and record and tell them what needs to be optimized in this paragraph. Should they enhance it? This is good, carry on and so on and so forth. So a student, can get a chance when they are back at home, have a cup of coffee and just listen and go one by one and say, oh, okay, I can I can do more statistical analysis. I can uh, do. Um, I'm so yeah. sorry, Ella, to interrupt, but uh, just to chime in and uh, note that we're running a little over time and we would move on to Safra's presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, this is my last slide as well. So I leave you to the safe hands and perfect hands of Professor Sesfield. Look forward to the questions as well.
Let me stop sharing. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to present you, as uh, Ella mentioned uh, in this uh, beautiful introduction, um, how we tackle, or, or I, I specifically tackle the hybrid uh, teaching. And I'm actually going to start much before the, the time that I started to teach hybrid. I'm the head of the curriculum committee in, in my faculty, Life Sciences at Tel Aviv University. And we've been trying to push that uh, for something like um, three years, maybe even a little bit more. It went very, very slowly, but now, of course, it's going very rapidly because lecturers start to see the advantages of hybrid teaching. But it wasn't so easy at the beginning. And I'm going to show you uh, different levels of technical digital teaching from the very professional all the way to the very amateur and discuss with you what fits which kind of class or which kind of course. So I will share with you the screen. Okay, and I would like to start with the very top of the professional uh, video recording. It's a course, which is actually a MOOC. That's a, a massive online open course, if I remember the words correctly, the abbreviation. Germ attack. Mumps, measles, rubella, whooping cough. I had them all. And you, on the other hand, are probably vaccine protected. Believe me, these diseases are no picnic, and viruses can be mean. Well, actually, whooping cough is bacterial. What's the difference? Good point, and it'll be my job to give you an answer. Hi, I'm Professor John Gershoni, and for 30 years I've been studying what viruses are made of, how they cause disease, and most important, how our body fights infection and what we can do to protect ourselves. Let me take you on a journey and explore the cells of our body, cells like micromolecular machines. And when we begin to examine their parts and pieces, the DNA, the protein, and sugars, we can also understand how germs invade our body, hijack and take over our cells, and what we can do to knock them out. To be honest, I'm on a mission. I want to arm you with a toolbox of knowledge, a practical sense of how viruses cause disease, how we gain immunity, and why vaccines work. So, come along. Let's go viral. So, as I said, this is really top professional um, video course making. It was done in a studio and outside the, outside the studio in our university. Uh, it's fascinating, but it has two main limitations of using it as, um, as a faculty. The first one is that when you make something like this, which is really a production, it's like a movie, you, you cannot really teach in depth uh, a course in an academic level. So it's, it's very good for the public, uh, but as a MOOC, but it's, it doesn't really serve our purposes for undergraduate students or nearly doesn't serve that. The second problem is that it costs a lot. Such a production is in the range of about between 100 and $150,000 per credit point. So obviously we cannot make all of our courses like that and perhaps not more than once a year even. So we had to reduce the cost and on the other hand, and at the same time, I mean, also enable a digital, a digital, digital course to be um, deeper, to have less fascinate, fascinating um, things that we introduce in order to make people engaged, but to give the entire course in the digital video. And the second example that I will show you is such a course that we have done uh, already something like three or four of these in the last year. 
in again in the studio but it's not a production which goes outside the studio it's just recording in very high quality the lecture uh, the presentation and it cost rather than 100 to 150 thousand dollars for credit core uh, credit point it cost only three to four thousand dollars per credit point so I'm going to uh, first apologize for hearing a few seconds not more than that in Hebrew it's a course in Hebrew um, but you don't really need to understand the, the words just look at the technical quality of the camera of the sound and get the impression of it and of course compare it I will compare it later uh, to other kinds of recording. Shalom lekulam, veburchem avayim lechelik sheli shos. So you can already see the camera. Let's look at this, for example. You can play. Hey, I asked you, what do you think about ecology? But because you are not from Ari, you should not forget. I wanted to catch the uh, a bit more colorful, but it doesn't really matter. You can see that uh, the editor in the studio can play with the lecturer being in front of the presentation, something that we cannot do, of course, in our office or in a classroom. Uh, they can take, it depends on the studio. The studio can have two cameras, uh, filming from two different directions and switching between them. You can see the lecturer once alone without the presentation, and then you move to presentation alone without the lecture, or you can put them next to each other or in front of each other. So, so it makes interest. It, it gives you a good, very good way to make the, the studio, the editing is extremely important in order to prevent the loss of attention of the students. And note also that, as Ella said before, these uh, films are quite short, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, in order not to lose the attention. So now I'm going to move to our days, actually. When we started to record in our office due to the uh, pandemic, and that, of course, presented a much, much lower uh, ability of technical um, to be professional, technically. So I will show you one of my first courses, one of my first classes. Again, you don't need to understand the Hebrew. Just hear the voice, look at the quality of the picture. And make it larger, of course. Okay, so you can see that the quality of picture is not bad. I bought a webcam, which cost me just $100 one time. So it's really, really cheap. And it gives a reasonable, it gave a reasonable quality, uh, but not very good, not, in, not as in a studio, of course. So um, what was worse about it is that at the beginning, my, my voice sounded well. And then at the end, towards the end of this same lecture, hear what happened to my voice. I was really appalled when I heard that. I, I was devastated, actually. And I couldn't do anything more about it. And I think that most of us, you know, I had hundreds of uh, hours in meetings, colleagues, and of course in lectures. So I, I, I heard and saw many, many colleagues uh, in our Zoom interactions and almost everybody have um, equipment which has some uh, faults, like with the sound, with the camera, they're, they're not professional, none of us, Usually, almost none of us have um, professional equipment. And that really has an effect on the attention of the student, on their ability to keep uh, their attention throughout the class. So what did we do about it? As the head of the curriculum committee, I 
thought about it and I said, okay, we cannot put three to four thousand dollars per credit point for all of our courses. But what we can do is buy, create our own studio, which would be, I would say, semi-professional, not amateur, not professional, but quite close to the professional quality that we are seeking. And we bought the equipment and we made the, we designated the room, which is just a meeting room for that purpose, um, aside from meetings. And I'm going to show you an example of one of the first classes that I recorded myself in this room. Shalom. So I hope that you could you could um, see and hear the much higher quality, technical quality uh, presented in this class relative to the previous class that I just showed you uh, in the same course. It's, it's really a big difference. And I think that this is much closer to the professional studio uh, rather than to the amateur equipment that I have in my office or at home. Uh, it's not so expensive. It's actually just something like three, uh, no, actually less. 1,000, a bit over $1,000 that we made as a one-time investment in order to purchase just a few pieces of equipment that you can see here. This is actually where I'm sitting now as well. So we have the camera that you can see here. Let me point, point to it. Okay, right here at the center, that's the camera. And I'm sitting just here. You can see it from the from the other side in the right picture. So again, the camera is here. I'm sitting right now here. I have a screen behind me in order to uh, prevent these distractions of the colored window. I have the microphone, which is here. Another microphone was here. I mean, is still here, but we just tried two of them and one of them was better. So that's the one we're using. And I'm going to show you another angle Again, I'm sitting uh, here and we have a board so I can just rotate the camera if I want to stand next to the board and show something on the board. Also, we have another piece of equipment that was harder to see in this picture, but now you can see it. It's called a light board that we uh, created ourselves in-house. I'm going to show you how it looks like and what you can make out of it. Okay, so this was um, uh, the idea of our vice dean for um, teaching, which is Professor David Sprintzak, and it was uh, carried out, designed and um, um, made by our very dedicated maintenance person, Awaka. So the instructor is just standing uh, across from the light board. There is dark, um, the, the room is dark and there is um, light source, very intense light source at the top of this light board. So you can see both the instructor and uh, what you write, what he writes on the board. And of course there is a mirror image. So you see it as if um, he's standing on the same side as you. Um, so this was not expensive at all. As, as I said, it was just uh, made in our faculty. So how can we make these um, self-made videos uh, engaging? Because one of the main problems that was mentioned in, your, in the previous lecture you just heard from Ella is that when a, an instructor is teaching through video, uh, the students tend to lose their attention very rapidly because it's kind of a fixed picture. We do not move around the class. You move the presentation, but it's not enough. 
in order to prevent the students from falling asleep. So one way to solve this problem is, as I told you, in a, in a real studio is to have two cameras and to play with the modes of what uh, exactly what you present to switch in between them. But that's not something that we can do in this semi-professional uh, studio. Uh, we can, of course, break it to chunks, um, although it's, it creates more work. And what I'm going to show you now is a third way to get the students engaged and to do active learning. That is to add annotations or what I call annotations. It's also called interactions using a, a software. The one that I used is integrated in Moodle in the course website. It's called H5P. And each one of these dots that you can see here, dots or circles in other videos, represent an interaction, a place where I pause the video and I add something, either a clarification or a comment or a question, different kinds of question or an elaboration. And I'm going to show you a few examples really quickly. So the first one, just to show you uh, how I pose the video, as if I'm now the students or you're the students. Uh, so I will start a few seconds before the pause. I'm explaining about this molecule, about these chemical bonds. Okay, now I, when I went over the video in order to add annotations like questions, I noticed that I made a mistake. Instead of saying reduced, I said oxidized or the opposite. So I paused the video and I added, uh, this is a saying a correction and the students now click on it. And it says here that I meant to say oxidized and I said reduced. And then they play again, of now course. Um, comment, another kind of comment. Again, the video is paused and I added something that I say in every two classes when it's a live class. What do they need to know? The students are very interested. We have a lot of details in this biochemistry course. What do we need to learn by heart? So from time to time, I I tell them that you don't need to learn by heart most of these details, you need to understand and so on. But it's very important to say it also during um, such a recording. And it's, it's better actually not to say it, but to write it because I add an annotation, I pause the video. So it's important in order to break the sequence uh, the, to prevent the students from falling asleep. And it's important that it's written. So they click on it, they see what they write, and then they move on. The next uh, type of annotation is an elaboration. So I'm explaining here about this molecule, and I will show to you what, what is happening here. Gamma, kvitsata shiara akarboxidit. Okay. So usually when I give this uh, class in a real class live, I use the blackboard in order to explain in more detail, to draw the molecule and to, to let them know exactly what I mean. And when I did the recording, I noticed that they wouldn't understand anything just from hearing me. So I just added a slide and pop it up during a pause. And then they look at it and they continue. Now I'm going to show you how I ask questions. The first kind of question that I ask, that's how I started my first classes, is to look at my video and about every seven to 10 minutes, to put a question, either a comment like I showed you before or a question. And, things, and since this was made after I recorded, I asked questions about what I just showed the students. For example, here, I finished talking about this slide, about a certain topic, and then, 
I moved to the next slide, but I didn't continue. And I wrote here, I made, I paused the video and I wrote here, you have to answer the question in order to move on with the recording, in order to hear the answer. Actually not to hear the answer, sorry. This is a, a question about the previous slide or slides. So it's a multiple choice. And let's just mark something that is accidentally true. So they know whether it's true or wrong. And then they refresh themselves and they, they, con they can continue hearing me without falling asleep. So I did that for a few classes. And then I thought to myself that this is not engaging enough, actually. Um, there is a way to better engage with them. And this is what I do in real classes, what I've done for the last um, many, many years. I decided that I'm going to record the class as if I'm in a real classroom, meaning that I'm going to think what questions I want to ask them during the class in order to advance to the next slide after they thought about my question. So it's not a backward question. It's actually a forward question. And I will give you an example. Again, sorry for being in Hebrew, speaking in Hebrew, but you can just notice from my hand waving that I'm asking a question. עכשיו השאלה היא, מה ההיגיון? למה נוצרה כזאת סיטואציה של G6ED deficiency גבוה באזורים בהם יש שכיחות מלאריה גבוהה? אוקיי, I asked the question, it means that I had to plan very well my recording before I do that, where I'm going to ask a question, and then I pause the video, it says here, think by yourself before you continue to the answer, they click on it, so they also see the question again in text. They think about it um, five seconds or five minutes. It doesn't matter to me. And then they click. And I tell them, well, the answer is so-and-so. So, -and -so. so um, there is one last um, example that I'm not going to show you because I don't have the right one with me. I didn't yet use it, but you can also add an interaction like that to add a link to another video, something from YouTube or whatever. Um, I think that that pretty much uh, finished my time and also what I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much, panelists, for sharing your valuable experience with us here today. Next, I'd like to ask the questions our audience has been sharing throughout the session. And at this point, if anyone has uh, questions from the audience, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A section. So I'm going to ask the first question to Dr. Ella. Any advice in working around digital exhaustion of students, aside minimizing the length or volume of the content? So with the help of uh, health and well-being department at Keel University, they offered us a nice pool of slides that would actually guide the students how they can do time management and look after their physical as well as mental health. Some of these slides I found uh, if I can tweak them and use them at the end of each 20 minutes, 15 minutes presentations would uh, in a subtle way guide the students, okay, jump now, do some exercise, do some activities, go for a walk, grab a cup of coffee, talk to your friends, whether this is a chat, I don't know, that this, that, you know, these are uh, uh, next generation, they use so many gadgets and, and uh, apps these days. So this kind of prompts them, now I can pause. This is the end of the session and I can uh, you know, pay attention to my own health, health and well-being as well. This was one way we took it as an organization, as an educator in the organization. The other thing is that I constantly remind them that why you are educating yourself is for leading a better and healthier life. So first you need to look after your own health. So again, in a very friendly manner, we can do that. 
I'm afraid because of COVID, we had limitations. So we cannot encourage them to go to like the gyms or we couldn't actually at that time or um, join uh, the, the clubs within the university to do some social activities and, and enjoy their lives. But hopefully after this period of mayhem is over, they have much more options. So hopefully, this is my answer. If Safir would like to add anything, do you have any ideas how we can help them with this exhaustion of digital? I, I think you said it exactly what I wanted to say. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Ella. Uh, this question is for Dr. Safrir. Besides the hardware investment, what software is needed? Nothing at all, actually. Uh, I didn't use anything other than just Zoom. That's it. A microphone, a camera, good microphone and camera. As I said, it costs us something like $1,300 to get a not professional, but you know, very good amateur or semi-professional camera and microphone, uh, a room. I would invest more if we would have um, the right room and we are going to do it in making good isolation, having a dedicated room that nobody would uh, pass too much, you know, making noises next to the room. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, next question is again highlighted for Dr. Safrir. Uh, Nicholas Spur is interested in uh, the light board. Is it digitized for student use afterwards? No, it's quite a simple instrument. Um, it's not digital. Okay. Um, again, uh, does the student need to have H5B software installed in their PC? Uh, to view this interactive mode for uh, interactive videos? Well, it's a tool that exists in Moodle. I think that Moodle is quite global for um, managing courses. And I think it, it exists in every institution, but I'm not sure. Maybe the institution has to purchase it. It's not something that every lecturer has to purchase. It's just an institu institutional probably uh, purchase software. But, and I'm sure that there are others. You don't need to do it just in how I, sh I showed it. Um, probably there are other software. Uh, next question is for Dr. Ella. Have you all used synchronous teaching with any of your classes? That is, any comments on teaching all students at the same time? Yes, indeed. For postgraduates, we mainly carried out the synchronous teaching using MS Teams. So this would make it more engaging. Actually, for one of my uh, lecture series, I, I got permission from you guys to incorporate some of the joke videos, so which would extend our license for the purpose of that lecture and the students could access during the time that the, the weeks that I was delivering that lecture to demonstrate some of the research relevant to the postgraduate, um, uh, you know, uh, degree. Um, for the undergraduates, we had uh, once a week, one hour, or every other week, one hour, synchronous time for the QA, for tutorials, to guide them to how to prepare for their exam. This was meant for casual conversations, not always in a, in a way to do the passive learning and, and delivering a lecture. But for postgraduates, because they are very mature, both at the School of Psychology, I delivered the synchronous one, and for the School of Medicine, I delivered the synchronous one. For undergraduates, we mainly focus on delivering lecture content um, through these educational videos and incorporating um, additional animations and educational uh, research videos from values uh, companies that we have uh, subscriptions such as Joe to enhance our, our own educational videos. It's like a video, a video. Um, and uh, for undergraduates, we uh, minimize the uh, synchronous things for the tutorial sessions and uh, problem based sessions, problem based learning sessions. Um, there's a question for Dr. Ella again. Is it possible to use Joe videos in an interactive manner in Moodle or only videos made by oneself? If the organization has subscription enough, uh, you know, like enough subscription to uh, embed these things into the platform. And one of the barriers that some of the questions towards that's a pretty was, should we use this software or that software? 
the fundamental things when you're using information technology is the compatibility. First of all, with your operating system, matches the software you're going to use, the technology is actually being doing a license to implement and embed it. If these things are taken, so that's why it's a team effort. So your IT services team should actually help you with some of this information, provide it for you guys, and then it comes with the, uh, you know, incorporating what you need, identify the provider that provides, for instance, for um, engineering, you need to reach the provider that provides um, educational technology in your field. For biology and medicine, I can go and um, you know, talk to job, job people. But for other disciplines, we need to find identify the groups that actually provide those videos for us. And then with the help of IT, I'm not IT specialist, I definitely consult with the IT services and see that, okay, is this compatible with things? Can I embed it here or is it compatible with the blackboard? Some technical things could be answered by Joe things. As uh, I clearly remember a couple of years back, even before COVID, uh, they instructed us how to embed things and uh, how actually we can make the most of these educational videos years and years before that. So hopefully I answered that. Thank you, Dr. Ella. Uh, for Dr. Zor, uh, uh, Marina would like to know that uh, what platform are you using to capture and deliver these recorded lectures? Okay, so I'm using, as I said before, I'm just using Zoom, but there are other software that may, that are more sophisticated. I forgot the name of one that is able to switch between modes like presentation and speaker, just presentation, just speaker, but there is something like that. If I remember the word, I will say it later. Um, so I record it and then I incorporate it in Moodle. And as I said, I'm using a tool which is in Moodle to edit the recording after it was done. So I do the recording at least a few days before the actual um, release is supposed to be in order to take time in order to make the, the interactions. Um, and I wanted to say, maybe it was clear, I hope that it was clear that this is not just a solution for Corona time or COVID-19 pandemic, because the whole purpose here is to improve the teaching. It's just not just a solution for uh, the time that we have to teach remotely. But this hybrid teaching, I think, is much, much better than being all the time in the class. I would say that there are two types of um, interactions with the students. One type is to give them the material. And of course, to engage them by asking questions. And as I showed you, I can do both in a recording, even to engage them thinking about what I want to say, not already said, but what I want to say. I can do it, I think, almost as good as in a real class, maybe. Uh, but it has the big advantage of the students being able to go back to pause to take notes in a very, very good way. So I think that after such a class, they know the material much better than after hearing me for 45 minutes when they are distracted by other students in the class and they don't take notes of everything because I speak fast and so on. So this is much, much better. However, it's very important to let the students also ask questions and sometimes it's also very important to give a part of the materials uh, in a more interactive way, like using the blackboard and so on. And for that, we have the live sessions. So we don't make just digital courses. The purpose is to take this course that I recorded this year and give it next year, all the recordings ready. And once every, let's say that my course is um, three hours of lecture per week. So every week and a half, something like every four hours, I'm going to have one live session, which is mainly for questions from the students, but not only. There are parts of the lecture that I kept for this live session because it's more appropriate 
to put them in a live session rather than in, re in a recording. A more kind of discussion, I would say, rather than just giving the materials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella and Safrir, for sharing your experiences with us. And I would also like to thank all the audience for joining us today for solutions uh, for hybrid teaching and learning from two distinct backgrounds and geographies will surely have given you valuable insights into the post pandemic models of education. We hope you discovered some helpful tips to implement in your own classes, whether they are hybrid, remote, or in person. This brings us to the end of our webinar series, engaging students with video remotely or on campus. I would like to remind you that you will receive the recording of this session via email in the next 24 hours. Please don't forget to uh, attend future Joe webinars. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us. This is Prerna Bhanushali. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.